Today, we're very fortunate to have the lead uh, speaker in this series on mission engineering to be Judith Daman, who uh, has been a leader in a lot of the work that's been going on with the Defense Department in systems of system engineering and mission engineering. Uh, uh, earlier, she was the lead editor for the DOD guidebook on, on uh, uh, engineering for systems of systems, and so we're, we're very fortunate to uh, have her a, as a speaker here today. And uh, uh, the the next two that we're going to have are are going to be uh, uh, Mark Goldenberg, who is uh, now leading one of the system mission engineering areas in in the Defense Department, and Dan Strickland, who is at uh, the uh, uh, Ballistic Missile Defense. Uh, uh, agency and uh, uh, has been, uh, they, they have a, a very much mission engineering uh, set of uh, things they do there. So, so Judith, we're, we're looking forward, forward to your talk. Thank you. <clears throat> Barry, thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I um, uh, welcome your generous invitation to kick off this series. Um, I think, as you noted, um, much of the last few years of my professional work has really been focused on how we can leverage systems engineering when we're dealing with problems that are beyond the individual system. And more and more, uh, the, um, there are opportunities that, uh, that call for the kind of discipline and value-added capability systems engineering provides. And mission engineering, I think, is a, uh, an increased new focus in the U.S. Defense Department, which applies across defense, but also applies in civil organizations and other, um, other, uh, other domains as well. So I think it's got a lot of promise, both in terms of making a, a contribution broadly, but also for leveraging the real value that systems engineering brings. So start first with mission. What are we talking about when we talk about mission? Here's a set of uh, sort of photos from um, sort of the popular culture. Um, mission Impossible, NASA missions, the space shuttle, uh, missions in the Southwest in terms of bringing the word from whatever perspective, including um, uh, globally, um, to, uh, to a broader population. Um, and, and it really brings with it this, this notion of focus, accomplishment, etc. And that's really a driver when we think about mission engineering. So what do we mean by mission? Here's just a selected set of, of um, sort, of, uh, sort of general uh, definitions. An important task, an important goal or purpose, tasks that perform a purpose or a duty, purpose, aim, objective. And in, in a military mission is really an operation that you're assigned to accomplish. So the big focus here, I think, is on purpose, outcome uh, and, and aims and objectives. And that's really the driver when we think about when we think about mission engineering. So first kind of starting from systems and system of systems, here are some sort of general definitions that we, we, we typically use that, uh, that I think start to ground us in what we mean when we're starting to look at how we apply systems engineering broadly beyond individual systems. System of systems is when you bring together multiple systems that have purpose and capability in their own right, but when you bring them together, they really are there to achieve some higher level objective. Most missions, when we start to look at them, require multiple systems to work together in order to achieve that larger capability. And then as a systems engineer, our job then is not building the pieces, but it's really bringing those pieces together and ensuring that they work together collaboratively to meet that objective. Now in system of systems, there's a couple of points of view. Some folks see system of systems as being purely technical systems, integrating, bringing together technical systems for a larger capability. Others see system of systems having a large socio element to them, including human systems, and that many system of systems include technical and human systems working together. 
Now, there are difference of viewpoints from a system of systems view, but I think when we move to mission engineering, and it's very clear when we're bringing multiple systems together to meet mission objectives, human systems tend to be a very important key part of, of treating um, a mission as a broader system and bringing systems engineering to missions. So what do we mean by mission engineering? <clears throat> At least in my perspective, mission engineering is basically taking a systems viewpoint, but in the mission engineering context, it's the mission, which is the system. The individual systems, including organizations and non-material elements of this larger system are all constituents of this larger mission system or system of systems. And what we're really doing with mission engineering is we're taking the principles we have from a systems viewpoint and we're applying them up at the mission level. Now the objectives of a mission tend to be operational mission outcomes. So then the objective of applying systems engineering across this set of systems is developing the capability to meet those outcomes. And it's that focus on the mission outcomes that really makes something a mission engineering endeavor. When you do this, the kinds of things that we do within a system of trades to how do I better improve system performance, system reliability, we do the same thing up at the mission level, but those trades are not only within systems, but they're across systems, they're across different elements of the mission, and can be across the human elements of the mission as well. So these technical trades when you're doing mission engineering really take place at multiple levels. And given the dynamic nature in which most missions occur, typically you don't hardwire a mission together and deliver it the same way every time. But given the variety of conditions that, that, uh, that can occur and can impact mission outcomes, you know, more and more we're thinking about this, of thinking about this as having compositional mission outcomes. Do I have a way that I can bring the right pieces together when I need to, to meet the mission? Which poses a whole new set of challenges for us as systems engineers. Stepping back and looking at system of systems, here's some examples, which um, I think you, know, you can probably relate to. They're from a number of different research programs, some of which are from the CERC. And they go from the smaller tactical, this is one out of the um, uh, European Commission Project Compass, looking at composing a system of systems to meet the needs of a listener for Bang & Olufsen in terms of audio-visual satisfaction. Uh, their, their outcome or the mission of the corporation was to bring uh, valuable, uh, positive experiences to the consumer under a variety of different conditions. The second one, actually also out of the European Commission Project Dance, really looked at emergency response. The objective here is to be able to respond effectively to a variety of different circumstances, and it requires bringing a variety of different organizations together, as well as technical systems to achieve that objective. And then on the right side is a CERC project done out of um, Stevens and Georgia Tech that really looked at, um, at the whole uh, area of combating counterfeiting and looked at it from a multi-level different perspective from a larger enterprise, but with the objective to, to be managing the insertion of counterfeiting into military systems and the objective being keeping those out and keeping the systems effective. In each of these systems, they're at a different scope and scale, but then the thing that would make them mission-oriented is the objective of the analysis is that top-level outcome mission. How do I manage these elements, adopt them, make trades in order to increase or achieve mission, mission effectiveness? So this chart tries to put systems, system of systems into a mission context. Um, I think most systems engineers in the world today really work down here at the system level, designing systems, developing components, trades to build systems. More and more, we've been now looking at how those systems fit together into a system of systems. 
when we move this into a mission context, we're effectively adding kind of another layer. And we think of this, it's been termed mission threads. And what these are, are what are the set of tasks or activities that need to be um, implemented, executed in order to achieve a mission outcome. Those mission threads then serve as an organizing principle to be able to evaluate how the systems in a system of systems actually work together to achieve those mission driven tasks to achieve top level mission outcomes. And it's those operational mission outcomes that are the objective, but you meet those objectives by executing the sets of tasks in the thread of activities that are critical to mission accomplishment through the use of systems configured in system systems. So this kind of brings all the pieces together with these mission threads being an organizing construct that allows you to relate the system, system, systems engineering with operational systems to meet the, um, to meet the meet mission outcomes. This move towards uh, more mission oriented engineering um, has been happening at the same time that in defense and I think other places we've been moving towards model based digital engineering. And um, I won't surprise most of you to hear me say that given the complexity of dealing with systems, system of systems, mission threads and operational outcomes that we're really not gonna be able to do this unless we actually take advantage of the kind of capabilities that digital engineering provides us. So what I've kind of depicted here is we're doing more and more work to really develop our systems digitally and then parameterize those systems in such a way that we can bring them together into system of systems models, um, often architecture models, in order to be able to understand how those systems are configured to work together, and then moving them into a, a, a mission thread context to evaluate how those systems are able to meet the requirements, really, of the end-to-end -end set of tasks that have been formulated as being essential to meet the mission outcomes. And then having digital environments that could actually represent that environment, that operational environment, operational simulations, where you can actually introduce the sets of systems to execute those missions and evaluate what's the impact on the mission outcomes. So no more are we sort of happy with only making sure our systems meet their objectives or that the system of systems work together against certain technical parameters. But the key thing is, if they work together against those parameters, how well do they execute the critical activities under operational considerations, threat environments, whole variety of other environmental and, and other characteristics that will determine whether or not the pieces we're bringing together and delivering actually meet the mission outcomes, which is what we had as our base objective. Um, more and more work is being done, if you look in the bottom right hand corner here, to really build tool environments. This is a depiction of the MITRE digital engineering platform, where we've been bringing together multiple different tools to allow us to have in the center, just as we have for digital engineering of the system, the sort of authoritative data about the mission context, the mission systems, their relationships, and then use that data to help us evaluate the mission from multiple different perspectives in order to um, really achieve these mission outcomes, applying the kinds of techniques that we've effectively applied at the system level, but now dealing with them at the aggregate level, system of system and mission level. Oops, a little too far. Okay, why, why do this? No, um, what are the motivations for, uh, for mission engineering? Well, first, no, um, that often the, um, the, you can think about system, uh, mission engineering as being a proactive activity. I've got a mission, it's really important, um, and I wanna ensure that that mission can effectively be executed under a variety of different conditions. Maybe I know that it can be operated under my conditions today, but I may recognize there's certain potential external impacts that we're gonna face in the future. So the question is, can I proactively go out and understand 
the health of my mission under these different circumstances in order to both assure that I've got mission capability when I need it, or identifying places where there are risks, gaps, or other issues that I really need to address in order to have that mission capability assurance. That then leads to what you can think of as reactive mission engineering. I find a gap. I know I've got an operational problem. Maybe there are cyber issues that make certain of my systems problematic. Um, maybe I've got human factors problems. I have a pandemic and I'm losing personnel. What does that do to my mission? So I want to react to things that I know are happening and ensure that I understand what impact they're having on the mission outcomes and what options I have for mitigating those actions. New systems, new changes in operations, and be able to then look at options and trades to improve the capability to react to issues that, um, that I've identified. And then finally, and uh, this is an area that um, I think research and engineering, which is where I do a lot of, of my work, um, plays a role, is more and more we identify opportunities, particularly technology opportunities, that as technology is changing, what advantage do they give me? And how can I leverage those to improve my mission effectiveness? So in an opportunistic way, you want to understand a mission, you want to understand how it operates, what the drivers are, what the dependencies are, and then identify places that emerging technology, whether it's hypersonics, AI, machine learning, um, advanced communications capabilities, where can I bring those to bear and use them as an opportunity to improve my mission impact, mission effectiveness. And you know, while I talk about this often in, in defense terms, often you know, uh, large enterprises are the same way. What can I bring in to improve my effectiveness, improve my profitability, improve my ability to achieve my overall objective? So the, these are motivations that apply to mission-oriented uh, endeavors. Um, largely defense in my world, but more and more in civil government and in private sector as well. So one of the questions we often get is, okay, sounds good. Theoretically, that's a great idea. So how do you actually go about doing it? So um, in response to this question from a number of different folks, we put together what we sort of colloquial call our playbook, our mission engineering playbook. Um, and it's a high level view of kind of key activities that you engage in when you're implementing mission engineering. So for the rest of the talk, what I'm gonna do is walk through these, talk about them and what's different since it's a mission engineering context than possibly other contexts, and then give you some example, give you, I'll walk you through an example as we go through so you can get an idea about what we actually mean by each of these. So just as a broad overview, you know, the first thing is right up front, you need to really understand, you know, what's the mission context and why am I doing this? Um, what's the question that I've got and what's the mission driver for this, for this kind of analysis? You want to pull a team together that really looks at the range of things that are going to affect this mission. And then you really need to go out and pull together the data, the model, and the analyses. Um, now, in, in most studies or analysis, you're going to do exactly the same thing. But with mission engineering, there are kind of different sets of people that you bring together and maybe some different kinds of data and models that you need to consider when you move into a mission engineering activity. And then the actual conduct of mission engineering is, is um, kind of shown in this big square box here. Um, the first thing is really understanding the mission context. If you want to know impact on the mission, you need to understand what the mission is. You want to know what the mission threads are. You want to know what are the, what are the mission outcomes? What are the metrics that you care about? And ground yourself in the mission context because that's going to be a driver. Um, then you want to basically say, well, what's the current situation? Um, often people want to jump right to options for achieving something new, but if you're not grounded in, in, in what you've got now, um, you really don't have a good basis on which to look at alternatives and trades. So really getting data and saying, okay, where am I now and how well am I doing against those metrics? And what are the drivers for gaps or risks that I'm identifying? That then tells me where are the areas where action could help me either uh, react to problems or take advantage of opportunities. And then identifying those options, you then use the tools that you use to 
really define and measure the current situation to then insert changes and evaluate trades in order to develop recommendations. The bottom element here, prototyping and experimentation, may be part of your mission engineering activity, or it may be a result of your mission activity. One of the things you wanna be sure that you do when you look at your options and trades is you really wanna make sure you've got good evidence for what the options really can offer you. And sometimes that means you wanna go out and do some prototypes and experiments to really get a good grounding on what it is you've got that can potentially be inserted into the missions. Or if you're changing the way things are done, you may wanna run some experiments to really evaluate whether or not people in the loop under the circumstances that you're talking about could actually execute the way you're positing in terms of the kinds of changes you're um, evaluating for the mission. And so those may be things that you do in the course of mission engineering in order to get evidence to help you look at trades. Or you may actually have some reasonable evidence. You may make your recommendations. You may follow that by prototypes. And if you learn things are not quite what you want, that maybe you loop back to another round system of mission engineering. So let me walk through each one of these and kind of give you an example of, of, um, of how we think about these being addressed. Okay, so the first is establish context and motivation. Um, we do a lot of analysis. We do a lot of studies. And, you know, we then say, okay, well, is this mission engineering or not? What makes it mission engineering? And, you know, if you're focusing on improving a platform, probably not mission engineering. But if you're trying to improve a mission and you're looking at different platforms or ways of using mission, now you're moving into a mission engineering context. So it's where the mission is your objective, mission is the driver, then you're moving into a mission engineering context. So you really want to think through that. And that's going to be important because that'll help you understand what kind of mission context data you're going to need, who you need on your team, what part of a larger enterprise do you really need to bring to bear in order to really evaluate mission in, 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 its, broadest, in its broadest sense. Now, the example that I'm going to use here um, is a proactive, uh, or, or is an opportunistic uh, uh, mission engineering activity where the, um, the example we have biometrics technology which we know provides certain sets of capabilities. And the question is, how can we effectively apply this to a mission? And the mission here we'll talk about is airport safety and airport safety through passenger um, screening. So the question is, how do I take this technology that I know works to a certain degree under certain circumstances, and how do I actually insert that into the mission in a way that actually has the mission outcomes that I would like, that is, increased passenger safety. Forming the team. No, uh, the, uh, the, the important thing here is that this is an engineering activity. So you need a mission engineering team whose objective is to address these questions. Um, very often we try to address these through various group activities, and, um, different panels of SMEs, all of which are important. But what we're saying now in mission engineering, we wanna take that and we wanna deal with it in a disciplined way using um, engineering and analytic techniques in order to um, really address the question um, using um, really using evidence and, and analysis. Um, so you want to take those external environment SMEs, we want to take subject matter experts who understand the operations and the requirements, and then the people who understand the systems that are involved, the organizations that are involved. And then finally, if your results are going to deal with things that are in changes in management and, um, and resourcing, um, you want folks there who understand that situation to be part of your team throughout. So as you're identifying sets of things that could potentially be done, you have folks there that can put those constraints into the equation throughout the activity. And then you're going to develop your plan, data, models, analysis. Um, and again, we typically do this when we're putting a study plan to begin with. But the one thing that's different here with mission engineering is you want to include technical analysis of how can I improve the system of systems, including operation, uh, uh, organizational and human systems, 
um, how can I improve the performance? And then also, how can I evaluate the impact of those changes operationally? So you need to factor into your plan both technical analysis as well as operational analysis. Because uh, I think mission engineering means making technical improvements that bring operational impact. So first, delineate the mission context. You really need to understand the mission, mission-related data that will support your activity. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> the, this includes the mission threads. Uh, the description of activities and dependencies that characterize the conduct of the mission, the scenarios, which say what's the actual context in which this, um, these missions are being executed, what are the constraints, what are the environmental considerations, and then the environmental factors. Very often with mission engineering, you've got legal factors, you've got social factors, that come to bear in terms of the context in which we're going to be introducing the mission. Um, and then very important at this point, you want to actually um, come up with an understanding of what are the outcomes of the mission and how do I measure both the performance of the system of systems that I'm bringing to bear on the mission and how do I evaluate the effectiveness of executing because it's those system and system performance connected with mission effectiveness that really give you the heart of the mission engineering analysis. So in this particular case, we have here a mission thread. Think of it as the passenger screening mission thread. It's a cartoon of what we actually used in the project. And then we basically said, well, what are the critical measures that I care about? Well, the, the bottom line is screening success rate. Am I finding the problems through the, um, through the screening process, um, either currently or with the introduction of the new technology? But also a part of this is if I don't get people through the screening process in time to meet their, uh, their, uh, their flights, um, it's not gonna be an effective process because there won't be passengers and I can't get them on the flights. So there's a set of metrics that may require some balancing when you evaluate various options. Uh, then analyzing the current capabilities. You've got the mission thread. You wanna technically know how am I doing this now and what's its performance. And we want to know operationally how effective is it. So I've got a baseline. Before I introduce changes and look to where to put the, the, um, the technology, you want to know how am I doing already? And, um, and then I've got some basis on which evaluating whether some of my options are going to be um, worth, worthwhile. Will that, is it really a good return on investment? Do I have an impact on the mission by making these changes? This means you've got to understand both the behavior of the elements of the system of system and the performance overall. This includes organizations and human decision making as well as the technical um, systems that you're using. And what you want to do is collect data on the current performance that can, you can use in this analysis and use when you look at the options. Um, and then you want to look at the performance of those systems in the execution of the mission activity. Knowing how they perform themselves is important, but more importantly is how do they do what I need done to achieve the mission? And how do I do it in the constraints that I've got in the mission? And then finally, you want to know how, what's the outcome? How well is the current system doing in identifying problems in the, in the, the passenger flow? Um, how quickly do people move through and how effectively do we find where the problem? So in this case, what we're really doing is having both an architecture analysis that will look at the pieces and its performance. And then here we use a, a, a systems dynamics model to look at the actual flow and effects as we th go through the process. And it's the interaction between the analysis of the technical architecture and the analysis of operation that allows us to make that evaluation of how am I doing now. The next step is now that I know how I'm doing now, the question is, you know, what are my options? I think in this case, we're saying is, okay, so if I want to improve performance, um, what are my options for inserting this new technology? Um, the options can be identified from a broad set of, of perspectives, extended technical 
community, stakeholders, um, and, and this is where you may identify some needs uh, for or opportunities for prototyping and experimentation if you feel that it's critical to be done as part of the mission engineering analysis. And so you identify the options and then you develop an approach to actually evaluate those options, their impact on the outcomes, and basically look at the trades among those options and alternatives. And so, you know, in this case, what we did was we, we took a set of alternatives um, and we actually laid out the design space and looked at the trades. Um, and, and here we did experimentation, not experimentation with people, but the conduct of experiments to be able to reduce the number of options we needed to look at. Um, and we've kind of laid out the workflow here from architecture um, analysis to operations research to identify alternatives, trades, and then a visualization of the results in order to inform the decision maker of their options and the impact of different options on different of the outcome measures so that they can evaluate um, the return on investment from a variety of different perspectives. Now, in some cases, um, you may want to do prototyping and experimentation as part of this process. As I noted earlier, you might say, well, you know, if I put this in this context, how will the, you know, the technical system operate? So you may want to, you know, build a prototype or take a system and do some experimentation with them. Or for something like this, where you've actually got a human system and a workflow, you might want to actually conduct some, you know, human in the loop experiments to evaluate how well will this actually work. Um, I often see this when I talk with operators when we describe doing these analytic kinds of results. You know, they're they're like, yeah, I think all of that's fine, but you know, you may want to actually get some experiential input in here before you make a decision, um, because some of the assumptions that you may be making about people and organizations may not be may not be quite correct. So, what we've got here is sort of an example, of something that we do often at MITRE. We call them simexes which are actually you no know, experiments where we put actual operators with their systems into an experimental environment and have them implement things as they're doing it now and then start to introduce alternatives and different changes and evaluate how well the workflow in the organization works. So this is an example of one of the kinds of things you might want to do um, to feed into making your recommendations about changes you might want to make in order to improve the, the, your, mission, your mission performance. Sometimes you also want to go through and do the analytic result, make the recommendations, and then as part of the implementation, conduct these kinds of experiments or other prototypes as you move towards implementation. So, you know, at the end, what you're really trying to do is create recommendations. You're trying to set it, recommendate, recommended actions. And often it's actions that say, oh, make this change in this system because we believe it'll operate in the system of systems in this way. It'll help improve the implementation of the activities critical to the mission and have an impact on the mission outcomes. So the basic idea here is you want a set of activities that allow you to make decisions about a variety of different elements of, of, of a mission with the objective and with evidence to, um, to allow you to uh, recommend actions um, to improve mission, which is, which is the bottom line. So, you know, in sum, what we've tried to do is kind of lay out uh, the understanding of mission engineering as a way of applying systems engineering approaches, to think about the different ways or reasons or motivations that may lead you to want to take a more mission-oriented mission engineering approach, and then the kinds of activities that you do where you're really leveraging things we do today for um, systems engineering at different levels but orient them towards the objective of improving mission outcomes through uh, analysis, uh, trades, um, and, um, and other types of analytic activities. So with that, I'm open to questions. Do you see the user experience movement fulfilling an aspect of the human component of mission-based systems? You know, I do. I think we've got, you know, 
I think there's an increasing kind of recognition of sort of understanding it's not only humans as they use systems, but the role of humans in these larger, more complex systems. And so I think we're going to see more, um, more emphasis on that. And that's kind of why I think, well, you know, in generally, maybe this idea about this experimentation um, may not be typically thought of as system of systems or even mission engineering, but it, it becomes important, particularly with missions, because sort of users and organizational decision making can be really critical in mission outcomes. Excellent. Jen, uh, mission engineering seems compatible or utilizes some of the concepts or practices of customer centricity. Is that an accurate statement? How would you see them as uh, the same or different? Yeah, I think that, um, Jenny, the, the customer centricity, um, I think sort of goes back to um, Mr. Curtis's question is that you really do need to think about individuals and uh, organizations and their role in execution of the mission. The thing that's a little different is it's often not clear who the customer is for mission outcomes. I, you know, I think if you think about, you know, let's take ballistic missile defense because it'll be an, an upcoming talk. You know, the nation benefits from our ability to deter or react to ballistic missile attacks, but it's not clear there's a specific customer. And so, um, so this is really raising it up and looking at more an aggregate level. Now you need to do it with you're going to have individual systems, and this is a system of systems issue, who have their own needs and concerns at the system level. And those need to be respected because if you, if, if you, uh, if you don't factor that into your planning, you may end up with um, expectations that don't play out because they're going to do what they need to do to run their system. But you want to be able to ensure that in doing that, they actually contribute to the outcomes of the system of system and the impacts on the mission. Great point. Okay. Well, just uh, to follow up on the James Mason earlier question, uh, yeah, uh, Bill Curtis uh, was the lead author of the People Capability Maturity Model. So the, that's uh, uh, confirming uh, your hypothesis of who he was. <laughs> Excellent. And, uh, Bill's able to speak directly to that if you'd like to, Bill. Yeah, the uh, in fact, I just sent you uh, in, in the Q&A section an A. Uh, People CMM was really a model focused on using the maturity uh, model context for improving the development of the workforce, uh, which is very different from the user experience movement, right. the UX right. movement, which is really focused on uh, designing user interfaces to systems to better uh, meet the needs of the user and what the user is trying to do. So that's one aspect of of this notion of of users being a component of a mission and and what they're trying to accomplish. So it's 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 really people CMM was different than what I'm talking about with with the user experience movement. Got it. Thank you so much for the, the context and for joining us again. Um, and again, trying to, to group these questions uh, a little bit in terms of their um, context. Uh, but Jennifer Rickus, if you'd like to ask your question directly, you're able to unmute yourself. Or if you had any follow up to your question. Just moving forward with that, in that case, with uh, James Mason's question, I understand that DOD was changing the focus from systems acquisition to capacity acquisition. Is mission engineering a tactical variant or instantation of capa uh, capability engineering? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I think the, uh, the capability engineering, actually, in my experience, has really been something that was strongly coming from the, from the UK, in fact. And I think it is very much aligned with mission engineering. I don't think we're going to change systems acquisition because you're not going to have effective missions unless you've got well-engineered and acquired systems. But I think what is changing or may change is that 
the requirements for systems that drive acquisition will be more bounded by the, um, the mission context that's driving these and that there'll be a continued mission, mission consideration throughout the life of a system's um, acquisition. So I don't think mission engineering and mission integration management and, and, and these other portfolio management replaces systems engineering or replaces system acquisition, but it actually puts a context in place so that there's a higher premium paid on the ability to use the systems we're acquiring in mission context to improve mission outcomes. There's actually a typo in my question. Oh. You should have said capability engineering. Right. Yep. Now uh, that's what I interpreted though. Yep. First time. Yep. Yep. And so we are, you know, I think there's been a, a, you know, a shift in the UK towards total capability. Um, and what this is doing for defense is actually framing the capability needs in the mission context, um, given the mission orientation of the, of the department. Yeah, for the example I was given, instead of saying we need 14 helicopters or an Osprey, they're saying I want to be able to move 300 Marines within um, 700 miles within two hours from the bell ringing. That's the difference between getting the equipment and the objective. Yep. And that's how it was explained to me. Yep, yep. And I think we are moving in that direction with, uh, with even our system acquisitions. And all of that helps us frame what kind of systems do we want to buy in order to achieve that capability. What mission engineering does is raise it to a higher level to say, the reason why I need that capability is I cannot execute a mission of uh, you know, littoral combat without the ability to do that. And so that then says the, the drive for the capability I need is grounded in the missions that I expect to, be, be, uh, to need to be able to execute. Thank you. Thanks, James. Um, and not to jump around too much, but David Shepard was kind of commenting similarly in the chat. I know it originates in a different context, but this reminds me a lot of domain modeling. If you're familiar with domain modeling, would you care to comment? Hmm. You know, I think that, that, you know, I think, I think there are similarities uh, but I think what's a little different, domain modeling, at least in my experience, tends to be, and I want to say narrower, but it's a given focus. One of the things about mission engineering that's tough is that, you know, and particularly for military operations, multi-domain operations tend to be the name of the game these days. So what you're really needing to do, and you see this in system of systems as well, as you know, having good comm modelers is important, but you may also need modelers of people who can do things with decision support and other uh, kinetic systems, et cetera. So they're kind of multi-domain in various ways. And so uh, so they've got another kind of layer of challenges, I think, above and beyond domain modeling, as at least I, I understand. it. Excellent. Looks like that addressed uh, David's comment. Um, switching back to Warren Vainman's comment, funding within DOD is focused on the program system level. Where do you see the funding for research and experimentation at the mission engineering level being allocated to? That's a, good one. That's a good question. And this is the perennial system of systems problem. I mean, I know like with Barry and Joanne and other folks when we were doing system of systems guide years ago, it's like, so who's going to pay for this, et cetera. And we said, well, it's going to be needed. So let's figure out how to do it because eventually there are going to be places where people are going to need it. And so I think that's kind of what's happening now is that I I don't, and again, I'm a big an institutionalist, so I don't see defense funding and other things changing radically, probably in my lifetime. But, um, but there are places like missile defense agency, uh, like multi-domain operations, JADC squared, um, that are places where organizations have identified the fact that they really do need to focus at the mission level. And so there will be there will be pockets or islands of of emphasis on this, and I think there'll be resources coming from those focused on 
particular priority problems that really require a mission outlook. Um, so I think it's likely to happen in that way rather than any whole uh, cloth change in the way we think about uh, funding um, uh, acquisitions um, or research. Um, and, and I think more and more, I think joint level concepts, people are uh, that starting at that level, there's an emphasis that we need to be thinking things about ways to really leverage our multiple service capabilities together. And as that happens and that starts to materialize into new ways of doing defense business, I think that'll be accompanied by, um, by resources. My question is more um, that I seem to see that there's a process aspect to what you're talking about as, as well as a system aspect. And so I was wondering, do you see that distinction and do you feel like these two aspects, if you do agree, that they are to be developed um, co concurrently by the same folks or if there's a need to really have different people focus on um, mission as as a system view versus how to achieve mission from a process view? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I actually think that, that your observation is quite right. Um, the, the, um, that there's a whole element of how do I execute the mission? What's the process? How do I go about doing it? And then the other aspect of it is what are the technical capabilities that I have to enable that? And I actually think they need to be done together because very often technical capabilities may open up possibilities for additional, for new ways of addressing problems that you might not have thought of if you're focused on the mission and mission execution and vice versa. There may be ideas about, I'd like to do this quite differently and that could actually promote the development and application of technology in other ways. And so I think the big deal about mission engineering is you're trying to deal with both of them and you're trying to deal with them together. Um, and I think that's actually healthy. It's also hard because people come with different perspectives and there's not necessarily a common model about how to think about things. I think that's actually why some of these digital engineering techniques are good because people can talk for a long time and think they're communicating with each other only to figure out that they're not really talking about the same thing. But when you actually try to put it into a modeling environment where you pull those things together that said, okay, so this is how you think we're gonna execute the mission using this. And people may say, holy cow, that's not what I meant. And you can then communicate because you've got something that's, that's, um, that's virtual that you can look at and, and, and exchange on. So I think it's both aspects and I really do believe they need to be done together. Thank you. Thanks, Terry, for your question. Great point. Um, again, there, there's kind of questions all over the place. Uh, so transitioning a little bit into Greg Miller's question. How does this differ from design reference mission introduced by Skolnick and Wilkins in 2000? Uh, I'm guessing it's in John Hopkins APL te technical digest and then revisited by Whitcomb and Giammarco in 2018, uh, ASNE's Naval Engineering uh, Engineers Journal. The threads, scenarios, environment, missions, uh, measures of mission effectiveness on slide 20 look like what they used. Yep, you know, very good point. And again, this sort of goes to say that what comes around goes around. I mean, uh, I think that whole notion of a design reference mission and using that as the context for analysis of a variety of different aspects of the mission fits in here very well. Um, and, and so I think some of the, the techniques and approaches that were developed there, we, we can take real advantage of now that we're thinking about the, the whole mission driven analysis and engineering in a, in a new and different way. I think it's another opportunity to, to use that approach and push it, um, push it forward and take okay. it. Okay, thanks. And All right, That's, uh, that that's good to me. A hey, uh, uh, follow up on that one. Uh, the Systems Good of Systems Engineering you. Guide, uh, the DOD guide, is uh, uh, the first version was 2008. Should we be looking for another version that incorporates more explicitly mission engineering? You know, I think that the, um, the, what we found with that guide, which is really quite interesting, is uh, because we sort of laid it out in terms of, you know, here are the principles and the issues, it's really seen, it's kind of stood the the uh, the test of time it still is 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 useful. 
I think that uh, that a lot of what's in that guide can really apply now to mission engineering, um, but I think mission engineering has other aspects to it as well. Um, I think, and you probably hear about this in, in a future talk, but Defense is really looking at putting out some guidance on mission engineering that I think will take advantage of what we've got for system assistance, but probably add some other things. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Daman, for the great talk. Um, I know you're, you're instrumental in development of the HLA standard, um, and I'm curious, what do you see the role for interoperability standards like HLA and DIS in system of systems engineering and mission engineering today? Do you see increasing adoption of those standards outside of the traditional applications or uh, a demand for further development or creation of, of other standards to support these activities? Yeah, good question. You know, I think the, um, the, the um, and in fact, let me just go back to that slide that's got our, got that, the, um, the digital engineering platform wheel on it. We're getting there. This is life in retrospect. Here it is, over here on this side. Um, oops, one more. The, um, one of the things that we're looking at very much is um, looking at standard ways to share data uh, the DIS and HLA, you know, really sort of fall under the, the uh, sort of category of today, we'd call it co-simulation, where you're running multiple simulations together. Typically, what we find, I think, in the digital engineering arena, um, uh, whether it's applied at a system or here at a mission level, is it's less uh, co-simulation where things are running at the same time, which those protocols are really set up for. And it's more that I'd like to say, take some uh, work out of my architecture modeling environment and then insert it in an operational scenario. So I can ask myself, if I make changes in that architecture or behavior of individual systems, how does it impact the operational outcomes? And so you'd like to have interfaces between ar uh, architecture modeling and operational simulation. So one of the things that we're doing is we've built some prototypes of Cameo to AFSIM interfaces to show that we can do that. And we've been using that very profitably. Um, but we basically say, well, that's good proof of concept. It shows that you can do this first step. But can we now move into a standards base? And we're looking now at OSC as a basis for doing this to build some standards-based interfaces between classes of tools that allow us to regularly bring multiple tools that look at different aspects of not only a system, but a system a system together so that I can take a common uh, source of truth, evaluate it from a technical engineering standpoint, and then also evaluate the same thing from, a, from the, the viewpoint of um, operations and share data in that way. So it's a little bit different kinds of interfaces that I think we're gonna need to allow tools to work together off of common data. And so I, I see that as being the current push um, and doing that in a standards-based way so that we've got freedom to use different tools under different circumstances without a huge investment in another new interface, I think it's just gonna facilitate us from growing the repertoire of capabilities we've got in order to address these kinds of problems. And again, Stephen, you're able to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask directly, but I'll just start it off. Uh, within the context of warfighter identifying a mission need, a gap for a solution, material or non-material, such as via JCIDS, discussions start often before robust engineering. Is there a set of best practices or data that should be known and gathered early for handoff to the engineers when they are called in? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> and again, this is my personal opinion, not the viewpoint of the Defense Department, but... I think if mission engineering becomes a normal practice, and you know, you could actually say to a degree this is happening with ballistic missile defense and missile, missile defense agency, you won't have what we've got with JSIDs is what one could see as kind of ad hoc capability-based analyses to identify gaps and go forward but you'll have organizations, Nuclear Command and Control is another one, that are responsible for current operations, modernization, and futures. 
And so the idea of identifying gaps and need for changes, improvements, or new systems would become part of the ongoing mission engineering process rather than a separate ad hoc activity that then would come to the engineers later which would mean the engineers would be part and parcel of the analysis right from the outset, which I believe could actually um, streamline the process to get more rapid development of responsive capability and field it into the mission context to improve capability faster and inform the engineering with operations and current capabilities. And it almost becomes uh, like a DevOps at the mission level rather than the ad hoc CBA JSIBs one-offs as we go along. So, you know, my hope would be you would, at least for standing priority missions, we would move into that basis where this would be an ongoing process rather than and with engineering involved throughout side by side with the, um, the, the operational users. Interesting, it looks like we got feedback too on, on uh, different guides, uh, Jeff Lauren, is referencing the Air Force's Early Systems Engineering Guide uh, and a Concept Characterization and Technical Description Guide, both from 2009, while Jeff Gardner in the chat mentions uh, DOD Mission Engineering and Integration Guidebook from 2019. This very high-level guidebook, 12 pages, establishes policy, assigns responsibilities, and provides a common framework for conducting mission engineering and integration in support of DOD acquisition programs. Yeah, the, um, like first, to, I think to Jeff's uh, uh, initial uh, guides, I think, I think a point that I was sort of hoping that I'd be making during the talk is that, that there are things out there like the design reference missions and some of the, the early conceptual engine, concept engineering work that Jeff references that I believe we really need to bring to the fore and look to see how we can leverage them. In terms of the 2019 guide, um, I'll try to tread carefully here, but I think that was um, an initial version, which I don't believe actually represents the direction the department is going. And um, it, it, it um, implies certain techniques and responsibilities that I think maybe have been overridden by different changes in the Defense Department. So I guess I would urge you to sign in to some subsequent talks where you may get an update on where the department uh, stands on those things. I'm not being um, an FFRDC person, I'm not in a position to talk for the department, but I, I would say you might wanna uh, sort of set that aside you know, as, as, as an, an interesting um, one approach that could be taken um, as part of a larger um, uh, direction in mission engineering. I'm glad you mentioned that too. And, and Jeff Lauren, you're, you're uh, unmuted, I see, to, to respond. Uh, but actually, Mark Goldenberg um, mentions in the chat there is a OUSD RE led mission engineering guide that is currently in development to replace the MEI guidebook referenced, to, to your point. Excellent. Good. Mark, thank you. Great. Good, good to know. Excellent. And as I understand, your model of a mission thread has similarities with an enterprise business process. Is this okay? So there's probably more to that question, but kind of yeah. in that. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, uh, business process modeling is a, uh, it, it comes out of the sort of business arena and it's, a, and it's an effective uh, approach to modeling mission threads. Um, so, you know, I think that, I think that you're kind of on the right track um, in that regard. Um, and, uh, and there are different modeling approaches that can be used under different kinds of circumstances. And when you start to move into uh, uh, sort of a non-DOD, even non-government uh, 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 approach, you really do start to look at you know, these larger mission activities that contribute to the sort of business outcomes. Um, Often the, um, the enterprise architecture uh, uh, modeling things have been very um, IT oriented and very focused, so they're very systems oriented or a particular type. And I think in general, um, mission engineering tends to be a bit broader. And it not only looks at the information actions, but the other actions and support. So if anything, it's, this may be a bit broader from a mission threat standpoint, but again, similarities in form, no doubt. 
Excellent. Thanks so much for that. Uh, anonymous question that came up. In the case of unprecedented missions, how would you suggest adapting the process you described? Yep. Yeah, I think that, and we've, we've, we've sort of been experimenting with this a little bit, is that um, the, uh, <clears throat> that, you know, typically, you know, I say grounded in what you do now and then look at changes, which can end up being a little bit uh, sort of uh, leaning towards things that are evolutionary rather than transforming. But I think you need to think about where you are now to, to move together. If you've got a whole new mission, you're likely to try to lay out, how do I want to do this? But I think what you also will do is say, what do I have now that I could use to do this by leveraging existing things? And how far does that take me versus, uh, versus starting from scratch to build something that can be actually kind of complex as we go along? So I think the, the idea is, is that you may want to lay out what you want to be able to do and then back into what have I got now to be able to do that, which in some ways is what the mission threads do, even with existing systems. No, and we sort of say, and we say this a lot with system of systems, but I think it applies the same with missions, is you don't want to simply model the system of systems only as it exists. You want to understand the mission threads of what it is I'm trying to do, and then what have I got now, and how well does it do it? So, you know, we, we'll call it like a middle out sort of a process rather than being totally top down, you know, there's the top down portion of it that says, what is it I'm really trying to do? And how do I know if I've done it? But then rather than saying, well, then I'm going to build everything fresh top down, you basically say, I've got a lot of things out here that I'm doing similar things with, what would those mean? How would I use those? And what would it mean to do it? And the result may well be there's nothing out there, I'm going to have to build something new, in which case you're really trying to build a whole new system but at the scale of a system of systems often. So I think that's kind of how I would approach that. Great, yeah, that does tend to open up a can of worms when you're trying to assess what, what you have <laughs> at your disposal, it sounds like. Uh, jumping uh, down to the end of the, the Q&A, um, Anthony DeVenti had the question, in the context of engineering and cost schedule performance, are you seeing work done to bridge gaps between these two areas? Uh, for example, early warning indicators that we're facing a cost schedule overrun. Um, what types of modeling languages and tools are being used to bridge these gaps? Got it. So um, I think that the cost schedule performance typically deals with an individual system. Mm -hmm. And at least the way I've encountered it is when you've got a larger mission that you're trying to manage today's operations, you know where the issues are and you have systems in the pipeline that are gonna be coming into the inventory, if you will, that once integrated, they will alleviate some of the gaps and improve the performance. So you typically are monitoring the, um, the delivery of those systems. And if, with, if you find that cost schedule performance problems are showing up with a critical system that was gonna fill a big gap, you wanna identify that as early as possible. And then you wanna ask yourself, okay, if that doesn't show up, are there other mitigations I need to take? Because I might've said, well, you know, Barry's gonna deliver a new system to fill that gap in 18 months. So I'll live with the risk for 18 months knowing it's gonna arrive. And then when Barry says, no, sorry, not 18 months, it's gonna be 18 years before you get the system. <laughs> you need to say, holy cow, we need to rethink this. And then you need to go back into that process to say if that solution is not coming and then take into account why it's not coming because that may affect what other options you look at and revisit it. So there's definitely, and, and one of the uh, enterprises that I'm working on that has a big mission orientation, we have a whole capability portfolio management operation that's really monitoring all of that and even monitoring you know, systems that are in sustainment that are getting more and more costly and needing more and more repairs, you know, that can also be a risk to, the, um, to the, the larger system of systems and may promote that you need to do something else. So understanding things down here in the systems 
and how they're performing in terms of development for new things or maintenance for others then can have an impact on the system of systems. And you need to factor that into your ongoing mission engineering analysis in order to ensure that you do operate pretty well today and you've got a good likelihood of improvement over time. Great. Uh, and that kind of ties into a couple of the other questions. So trying to, to find a way into it, uh, you mentioned what you're doing uh, right now. Scott Schmidt asks, what are some of the lessons you've learned ex uh, or lessons learned you experienced related to the MITRE integration environment as you were completing mission level analysis to address example of airport safety? Let me see. Um, a couple of things bundled in there. Um, the, uh, you know, I think that one of the things that we've learned from the MITRE analysis that played out in the airport passenger screening um, project and others is that, you know, you've, the systems engineering um, has gotten, I don't want to say fragmented, but it is kind of fragmented. We've sort of valued that we've got specialists in different areas. You know, you've got, Barry's got a whole horde of people who are great with cost analysis. We got other reliability guys that are, you know, really good at these things. And people in various parts of the discipline have developed methods and tools that really do their job well. And as we move into a digital engineering environment for, for missions as well as systems, um, what you really want to do is you don't want to tell them that, no, I'm sorry, you're not going to use Cosismo anymore. You're going to use some tool that I've built as a plug into Cameo or something. It makes no sense. What you want to do is allow them to really do what they do well, but find a way to integrate those tools, which is kind of what this little wheel is, is, is being asked for. Um, how do I pull those tools together and bring teams for people, collaborators. And that's kind of a point that in the, um, in, the, in the playbook is that you really need to pull a team together that might have multiple people who have different viewpoints and look at problems differently to bring those perspectives to the complexity of a, of a mission context problem. And so, um, so I think one of the things we've learned is, you know, be prepared to do that be prepared for the fact that people are going to bring tools that they're comfortable with. And you need to think about ways to have common shared data across those tools, rather than what we often do even with systems, the cost guys go get their own data from the design guys and other guys. And it's kind of no wonder we don't really have a coherent picture about what's going on with the system. And what you're really trying to do with mission engineering is to get a coherent picture, but between operators and engineers and capability managers, acquisition folks, et cetera. And so, you know, I think that, you know, understanding that that's the case, understanding they've got tools that make sense to them that can bring value and that this needs to be a collaborative enterprise, I guess I think is my biggest lesson learned out of working these things. Great point. One yeah, one could argue that's the essence of systems engineering is bringing those together. And so up at the mission level, we're doing the same thing, but it's a broader set of folks. Yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate the thoughtfulness on that. Thanks, Scott. And actually, as you bring up the playbook, we had a question on that from Ricarte. Chuck, looking into your playbook, there seems to be some adoption from agile perspectives both in process and organization, how would you recommend more traditional, i.e. phase waterfall, uh, SE orgs to try this? Yeah, the, um, the, Barry will laugh at this, the, um, uh, when we were doing the system of systems things, uh, you know, everybody wanted to force it into a V model. And we basically said, you know, system of systems is not a once and done you're not gonna update everything and have a new version of the system of systems. This is an incremental process. You've got a lot of external inputs that you need to factor in as you evolve it. You need to reevaluate where you are after each sort of, um, you'll get my point in a second, wave of activity. And so we developed something which we call the implementer's view, also known as the wave model which says this engineering is an ongoing basis. You've got individual systems that'll be going through V upgrades, but the, but the, the, um, the overall um, 
system of systems. And I think in this case, the overall mission is going to be evolving over time. And so putting some kind of discipline into it, where you try to do this in you know, a disciplined fashion with some sort of pardon the analogy to, to, to defense, but battle rhythm that says, you know, I'm going to do upgrades. I'm going to review the status every year, every six months, every week, depending on what part of the system of system or mission you're in, to have a wave model that allows you to incrementally make changes on different parts of your mission, but bring it back up integrated and evaluated in terms of how well it's performing externally and how well it's performing and then external impacts to then make decisions about the, what you need to do next. I think is a very, it's an agile approach, but up at a system of systems mission level. And I think that really fits with missions as well. So it, it ends up looking like agile or DevOps um, at, at scale, which um, which I think is really what we're dealing with, but you need to bring some type of discipline to it. So, cause you can't be evolving everything all the time. You know that from software systems, for example, that you need to have some, um, some battle rhythms, some processes to really bring things together, evaluate them, make decisions and continuously upgrade. So my personal view is as we get more experience with mission engineering, we'll find, um, we'll find ourselves adopting that kind of an approach and benefiting from the work that's been done in Agile and more and more done in DevOps. Great points, I saw Barry nodding along. Uh, Barry, did you have anything to add to that point? Uh, no, I, I totally agree. I, I think uh, uh, a lot of the things that are going on with continuing continuous development and deployment uh, 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 are critical to doing systems systems and, and mission engineering and that uh, you, you need to have your antenna out uh, to make sure that uh, as somebody uh, does a, a breakthrough in some part of the system that, that uh, uh, you, you make sure that there's a way to make that compatible with the rest of the mission. That's right, yep. Yeah, and I think it's that, it's, it's interesting because that's a really good point. I think it's something that more and more we're seeing in the discussions of systems to systems. So system to systems early on was all about control. How do you keep people from changing things that, that interrupt other things to the point of no, you know, maybe you wanna let organizations innovate in different ways. Now you need enough of an understanding of the system of systems dependencies so that you can accommodate that and not break things in major ways as this happens. But if you don't allow for that, you're not going to have growth, innovation, and not system of systems and missions won't benefit from it. So it's a, I think it's a changing philosophy about system of systems that I'm seeing. That's great. And uh, Joseph, uh, I, it looks like you're unmuted to ask your question directly. It kind of ties in. So the, yeah, the network technology evolves so fast, uh, faster than the DOD life cycles. And I was wondering how fast do you perform that process given that networking and internet of things and all these technologies evolve so fast, over. Yeah, I think that, um, that one of the things with system of systems and I think with missions as well is that different parts of the, of the mission or the system of system are gonna evolve at different rates. Um, the issue comes into the fact that when, if your system of systems or mission is architected so that there are large dependencies, what that does is inhibits your ability to take advantage of rapidly changing technologies like the ones you're describing, um, which then behooves us to think about more distributed, maybe disaggregated ways to think about architecting our mission so there's flexibility for different parts to innovate at different rates without adversely impacting other parts or being held back from adoption because of those potential adverse effects. And, um, and so, you know, that kind of runs counter to a lot of the pushes where in defense where we're saying, well, we need one way to do it all so it'll be easy for everybody to work together. Now, the, the downside of that is you often do the one way to do it all um, based on the best technology at the time you do it, but updating everything all at once with these large complex missions is really tough. So I think there's a trade and it goes to the way you actually go about architecting your, um, 
architecting your system a system or your mission capability in order to allow for what you're describing. Excellent, and thanks, Justin, for the question. Um, moving to Kathleen Giles' question, and again, Kathleen, you can unmute uh, to ask directly, but your question in the Q&A says, how do you think DODAF and SysML will need to evolve to support mission engineering principles? Kind of touched on this previously, but. Yep. Yeah, you know, uh, the, uh, I would say, you know, we are there, we're, we use SysML uh, a lot and, it's got some, uh, it's got some uh, features that you might not want, but the value of using a standard language, uh, uh, I think overrides those issues. And I think with SysML 2.0, we've got folks who are actively involving this and are adding those, those kinds of things. Um, I guess I would have to say that I'm over DODEF. I think in DODEF came out of the C4ISR framework that came out of MITRE. And I think when it was initially done as the C4ISR framework in DODEF, it was quite useful because it actually got people to think about the fact that system of systems work together. You need to understand that. We need to express it in a way that we can share it, et cetera. The dilemma, I think, came as we became maybe a little too enamored of DODAF and the views and the other sets of things that we then started to see things as DODAF views rather than saying, thinking about things as, as I would, uh, activity sequences, mission threads, systems, et cetera, that, um, that our current modeling capabilities, et cetera, allow us much more flexibility to really use these tools to get after the problem. So, um, so we tend not to use DODAF unless we have to. Um, there's nothing wrong with some of the DODAF views and some of the kind of sequence diagrams and other things akin to those views, but continuing to call them views makes people, I think, be comfortable with that templated perspective that was very good maybe I don't know, a decade ago, but I think now um, we're much, we, people are, are digital centric, uh, uh, digitally uh, competent. We all use models to do various things. More and more is the case that I think we don't need that anymore and we can go to a greater flexibility. Again, probably not speaking, for, definitely not speaking for defense or for MITRE, but that's, that's really my personal view. Appreciate that and kind of goes to uh, what Joseph was saying about how things transition so quickly. Yep, that's right. Um, and Bill, since I know you're still on, uh, your question, um, and again, you can ask directly, uh, you mentioned the Consortium for Information and Software Quality is identifying our, uh, architectural weaknesses that can be detective and, uh, detected and quantified to create quality measures for MBSE models. Do you see systems of systems weaknesses as being different and at a higher level than system level architectural weaknesses? <clears throat> or are they conceptually different types of weaknesses at a higher level? Oh, that's a, that's a good question, Bill. You know, my intuition is that, uh, that, that these are systems, even though they're systems of systems, and uh, that means there's constraints on how you can architect them because you're not going to replace everything with a common approach across the board. Um, and that may introduce system of system architectural weaknesses or potentially strengths, depending on the kind of diversity that you get through doing that. So, um, so I am not sure that there are conceptually different kinds of weaknesses at a higher level. But I don't know that we've had enough experience really looking at it to know. Well, that, that's a relief. And I'm, I was hoping that's what I would hear. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Fantastic. And we have three questions, well, and co slash comments left. So, <laughs> Judith, thank you so much for staying on for this. Sure. I love the questions. They cause me to think about things differently, which I like. Thanks. <laughs> and it's great to get the perspectives from kind of our wide array of audience. Um, uh, Bill Casey has a, a good question here, and he kind of alluded to it before, where he says, it seems like finding sponsorship in the DoD for platforms is doable, but who's paying for something as smart as mission engineering? Got it. 
Well, you know, I think we've got high priority missions, like I was mentioning before, ballistic missile defense, nuclear command and control, you know, more and more JADC square, multi-domain operations. So I think there are going to be selective areas that the problem space is, uh, is important enough that people are going to make investments and will be doing things as smart as ME. Um, we also have you know, a congressional push that has said we're spending a lot of money for exquisite platforms, but we're not clear that that's leading us to better defense mission capabilities. And so they're pushing back to take a look at this. Um, you've got uh, the new, the, the DUSD, uh, OUSD um, research and engineering um, who uh, I work with. Um, that is basically saying mission engineering, mission integration is really important because that's what we're really about. And they're making investments in doing this and, and, and trying to develop best practices and applying them to key missions. So I think, again, as I said earlier, I do not see there's gonna be a wholesale change in where money goes. I think platforms and systems will continue to get the bulk of the dollars. But I think more and more, there's going to be an emphasis on understanding the mission context, if nothing else, to ensure we're buying platforms with the right capabilities so they'll fit in the missions. But I think more and more, it'll look at different ways we can make investments to get those. So I see a shift in that direction, but probably not a large one or one right away. But I do, I do see this happening. Uh, one minute more comment on that. Uh, yeah, we are going to have uh, Dan Strickland uh, from the Ballistic Missile Defense Agency uh, talk as one of the three CERT talks. And uh, so this is something that he and then BMD uh, uh, do for a living. And uh, the, 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 the threats change and, and uh, the uh, technology changes and, and the uh, uh, component of uh, uh, components of, of the, uh, uh, the the command and control and and the uh, the missiles and and, and the like uh, uh, all are evolving. So we'll we'll look forward to his talk uh, soon. Great, great, fantastic. Again, elaborating from Doug Ebert's question, uh, it seems there's a strong link between mission engineering and good requirement rating i.e. not proposing design solutions in the requirement, particularly in missions where solutions can be hardware or operational in nature. Do you agree? You know, I do, but I think that requirements, I've been struggling with this actually. Um, you, know, you know, we're accustomed to writing requirements and then putting out, you know, uh, proposals and AOAs and, and, and things like that. And I have the sense that, um, that, when you've got a gap in a mission, the, the point you're making is absolutely true, where you don't want to automatically say, oh, uh, I'm sure a bigger weapon is always the answer, or another airplane if you're in the Air Force. Um, you want to say, what is it I'm trying to do? Why can I not do it? Try to false isolate the factors that are contributing to it and then look at a range of options to uh, really address that and get the outcome. But in some way, um, you are in fact then doing a more robust requirements definition as part of the mission engineering. And you're basically even saying, you know, well, bring in these three sensors from the Navy and add them in here and do this. I can solve the problem. I don't need to require write a requirement i don't need to 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 do those sort of things you know what you need where you need it and then you bring things in to do it so i think it 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 changes what the way we go about requirements and and so i I'm, I'm not really sure what that means so you're in a big enterprise that's doing mission engineering you still got a requirement shop that wants to write detailed requirements and i'm like just not sure that works. Maybe you build a pilot, you build a representation in a mission engineering environment, a, a digital engineering environment that shows this is the capability you want, and then you give that capability out to procure an actual system to do that. 
is that good requirement writing? I think it's quite different. So um, I have honestly not sorted this out, but this is something that's been bothering me, frankly, that I think we need to think through. <laughs> you and many others. Interesting. Uh, and Rob uh, Cloutier kind of adds in from it, uh, obviously saying great presentation, Judith, thanks. Uh, I'm still sorting out how this differs from just doing a good job of defining the concept of operations, but that's just me. Yep. Yeah, no, I think that the con ops will go into the mission threads to a degree, um, you know, where here's the mission thread and this is how I want to uh, uh, basically employ my, or how I employ my current capabilities to do this. And that looking at different ways to employ your capabilities or different capabilities, I think is all part of the trade space. So I think that, that con ops and, uh, and, and, and all of those ideas really play out when you're actually looking at how we do things now and, um, and, and, and what my options are for doing them differently. So. Excellent. I, I know we went through all the Q and A, which, is a Herculean feat in and of itself. Right. <laughs> so thank you for that. I do believe there were a couple questions that I might have missed in the chat. So Judith, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll send them to you. Great. Uh, include it as a follow-up. Um, but since we're getting to be about a quarter after, which is essentially as much as your presentation itself, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I just want to thank you again so much for your presentation, for everyone for joining in. Um, and as Barry mentioned, uh, we do have the upcoming CERC talks. Uh, and then Judith, if you don't mind going to the, to the end of the slide deck, um, we just wanted to let our audience know that our year-end event that we normally hold in DC, the CERC Sponsor Research Review uh, is going virtual. Okay. Along with uh, just about every other event in 2020, it seems like. Yep. But thank you so much. I know this this intersects so uh, nicely with a lot of the other talks that were given and just uh, how things seem to be moving forward. Um, Barry, I, I don't know if you had any other points you wanted to add as we wrap up. No, I think this has been a, a wonderful session, yeah. And I, we, we, we certainly I have a lot of, of challenges that, that it's uh, got to uh, uh, address, but it's uh, Judith has given us a really good framework for doing that. Great. Well, thank you, Barry. Thank you so much for the invitation. As you can tell, this is a topic that I'm quite interested in. So having a chance to engage and folks who are on the line, if you, you know, <clears throat> look at the material afterwards, have other questions, please feel free to, um, to email me. I would love to interact and um, hear your perspectives on this as we kind of as a community all work together to kind of sort out how we take advantage of the, you know, amazing assets we have as a systems engineering community, how we actually leverage those as as we move into this area that's got some differences but definitely um you know can clearly benefit from the from the the, the real um repository of talent and capability we've got so thank you thanks so much with that we'll see you hey, at the next thanks everybody All right thank you bye-bye bye bye take care